Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, an incredible prehistoric pseudoscorpion has been found trapped in amber, evidence for paleolithic humans hunting cave bears has been analysed, sperm whales have been found to have a much more complex language than we previously realised, and much more. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Nature has tried to find out the peak annual global temperatures further back than when the records began in the 1800s. The summer of 2023 was confirmed as the warmest since this time by quite a large amount, with the effects of anthropogenic climate change being boosted by the naturally occurring El Niño weather event. Researchers wanted to see if they could work out peak global temperatures past the time that these records began. Similar studies have been undertaken in the past. For example, one study done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concluded that there hadn't been such a sustained period of higher temperature for about 125,000 years, since the last interglacial. Which, by the way, keep an eye out for our video about this period of time, coming out later this week. That study used geological evidence such as the analysis of ice cores and sediments from the deep sea, but this new study has used the more specific data they can gather from particularly old trees. The rings that can famously tell you how old a tree is can also tell us a great amount about the local climate at the time. For example, the gases dropped in the hunt for the World War II battleship Tirpitz left a mark on the trees growing nearby, as discovered in a study we reported on a few years ago. This study looked much further back and confirmed that the summer of 2023 was indeed the hottest in the last 2,000 years, and by quite a margin. The coldest reconstructed summer was found to be the year 536 and was 3.93 degrees Celsius colder than 2023, which in global average terms is quite significant. The study, while pointing to the El Nino weather event as something that helped 2023 become a particular outlier, says that their research emphasises the need to create further international agreements and divert further funding to decrease carbon dioxide emissions. Also in the recent news, researchers have made the amazing discovery that sperm whale communication is far more complex than previously realised, and surprisingly similar to human speech in certain ways. Sperm whales are very sociable animals that engage in complex group activities, and they communicate with one another using sequences of clicks that are termed coders. Previously, researchers had shown that some of the coders are used to transmit information about the identity of the caller. However, it was thought that there was a limited number of coder types that these whales used, about 150 of them globally with different populations of sperm whales using different types. This seemed a little strange though, considering the complexity of the animal's behaviours, it didn't seem to make sense that they had a comparatively simple communication system that had a fixed set of messages. That's where this new research comes in, analysing the recorded calls of the Eastern Caribbean clan of sperm whales. The scientists discovered that the coders actually show contextual and combinatorial structure. Essentially, the sequences of the clicks depend on the context of previous coders, and they also modify coders by adding an extra click, as well as altering the rhythm and tempo of coders. All of these variations are sensed and acted upon by other whales that they communicate with, showing that they are indeed deliberate components of their vocalisations. These modifications can therefore be combined in lots of different ways, resulting in a far more complex communication system with many more possible vocal variations. So these animals are almost using something akin to an alphabet, and indeed the researchers term this the sperm whale phonetic alphabet, with basic coder types that can then be modified and combined. Context and combining vocalisations are important parts of human languages, and so the discovery of a similar occurrence in whales is truly astonishing. The precise meanings of all the different click combinations are still unknown for now, but clearly these animals have an intricate language that will be fascinating to explore more in future. More whale news next as, sadly, Japan is planning to start hunting fin whales again. It already hunts minke, say, and bride's whales, and the fisheries agency is seeking public comments on a proposed plan to add fin whales to the list, and will seek its approval at the next review meeting in mid-June. Japan resumed commercial whaling in its exclusive economic zone in July 2019 upon leaving the International Whaling Commission. It had been carrying out research whaling for 30 years, which many saw as a cover for commercial hunts, which have been banned by the IWC since 1988. Japan has a tradition of eating whale meat, and after World War II it was seen as a cheap source of protein. Consumption in 1962 reached a peak at 233,000 tonnes, 
but whale meat was soon replaced by other meats, and consumption in recent years has reached a low of 2,000 tons. In fact, last year, Japanese whalers only caught 80% of their quota, which equated to 294 minke, brides, and say whales combined, which is less than the catch under the so-called research program carried out in the Antarctic and the Northwestern Pacific. Japanese officials want to increase the amount of whale meat consumed as a nation, and to realize this ambition, a whaling company has opened whale meat vending machines in Tokyo, Yokohama, and Osaka to boost sales and says it plans to open more at about 100 sites. More alarming, it has built what is being described as a mothership. The Kange Maru weighs 9,300 tons and cost $48 million to build, and is leaving sometime this month for its maiden voyage off the northeast coast of Japan. It has a crew of 100, a range of 13,000 kilometers, and can store 600 tons of meat at a time, thus enabling it to remain at sea for long periods. This has made some conservationists suspicious that the vessel will not just be used for whaling off the shores of Japan, but also in the southern ocean. The reason why fin whales have been targeted is that stock surveys have confirmed there has been a sufficient recovery of their population in the North Pacific. Indeed, fin whale numbers are on the increase in some areas, but the IUCN still lists them as vulnerable. Their numbers are increasing because of the whaling ban, but they also face many other threats in our seas, as do other cetaceans. So if Japan persists in this, they may not be hunting them for many years before their numbers plummet again. First up in this week's paleontology news is the fascinating discovery of a new species of pseudoscorpion trapped in 50 million year old amber. Discovered in an Eocene Age deposit in India, it's exceptionally well preserved and shows many features that allowed paleontologists to identify it as a relative of a modern pseudoscorpion called Geogarapus, which inhabits Sri Lanka, India, and New Guinea. It's been named Geogarania valiaensis, and it is actually one of the smallest adult fossils of pseudoscorpion to have come from this region at just 0.6 millimeters in body length. It also adds to the known diversity of arthropods that lived in and on the bark of trees that were around at this time. And it's truly astonishing that such a tiny creature was frozen like this for 50 million years, allowing us to learn more about the smallest invertebrates that made up the biosphere of our planet so long ago. In other news, researchers think they may have found the earliest evidence of the Earth's magnetic field, dating back to a whopping 3.7 billion years ago. The study begins by detailing the importance in us understanding as much as possible about our planet's magnetic field. By understanding more about its past, we can further understand its role in protecting the planet from cosmic radiation and atmospheric escape in its early days. Atmospheric escape is when an atmosphere with particularly high pressure can lose particles to space, which is a process that came up last week when we talked about the possible reasons that may lie behind the relative dry state of Venus. The way that the history of our magnetic field is so often documented is by looking at the magnetization of rocks that formed particularly early in our planet's life. This is rather tricky because as we're going so far back, these rocks have had a lot of time to be influenced by heat, pressure, and other things that may change the magnetic record held inside them over billions of years. The researchers on this study believe they've found evidence for Earth's magnetic field from rocks in Greenland, and have thoroughly tested their analysis as they became more and more confident of their conclusion. While it is of course difficult to be 100% on anything this colossally far back in our planet's history, the team are confident enough to conclude that the magnetic field that they believe existed 3.7 billion years ago may have been strong enough to have an effect on atmospheric escape during the Archean Eon. Hopefully more studies can look to incorporate this new evidence into future work, and we can learn even more about how planets form, and why ours was so conducive to life. This last week has also seen the naming of a new species of Titanosaur, which is always exciting. This new dinosaur comes from the end of the early Cretaceous, between about 112 to 100 million years ago, and was found in northwestern Brazil. It's represented by a sequence of seven vertebrae from the tail, which display unique characteristics that enable paleontologists to name this as a new species, Tiamat Valdesiae. Tiamat comes from the name of a goddess in Sumerian and Babylonian mythologies, described as having the form of a dragon or serpent. The paper also explains that Tiamat is identified as the mother of dragons and of all gods, which is appropriate for this new dinosaur as, significantly, it has been found to represent a very early branching member of Titanosauria. Therefore, it represents a species close to the common ancestor of the Titanosaurs, the largest animals to have ever walked. Tiamat therefore helps to better clarify the early evolution of these astonishing dinosaurs, 
as well as increasing the known diversity of dinosaurs in this particular time and place in prehistoric Brazil. Not only that, but a biomechanical analysis was undertaken on the tailbones of Tiamat, which found that the anatomy of the bones, specifically this part here, where the neural arches of neighbouring vertebrae fit with each other, provided the tail with greater stability against shear loads and also enabled a greater range of sideways movements, while still maintaining the integrity of the joints. So a fascinating new dinosaur discovery. Next up, a new study has examined the evidence for Paleolithic humans hunting bears, and the different ways that these ancient people used them. As the paper explains, evidence from open air settings as well as cave environments show that Paleolithic humans and cave bears coexisted in the same habitats and even in the same living spaces and cut marks found on bare bones indicate that these people would have used bears as a source of food and materials such as furs. This new research has therefore studied five different sites in Germany that preserve bare fossil assemblages with evidence of human modifications, to see in what ways people used the bear carcasses. Overall, it was found that cut marks associated with butchery were the most common type of modification found on the bear skeletons with evidence of different butchering stages identified across the bones. However, the wide array of different modifications also confirms that humans utilise cave bears in many different ways, such as by making pendants and tools out of their teeth and bones. Interestingly, it was also found that over the course of the Upper Paleolithic, the frequency of human-bear interactions increased considerably, showing a notable change in human-bear relationships, which was not good news for the bears. It seems that the cave bears became overhunted by humans and were also in competition with them, which together likely resulted in their extinction. This change in relationship was also reflected in the innovative use by humans of cave bear remains as tools and ornaments, as well as how they were depicted in Paleolithic art. It's a really fascinating study showing just how significant the human impact has been over the last few tens of thousands of years. And finally for the news this week, a study has been published that analyzes the fossil bovid assemblages found at a site in the cradle of humankind in South Africa and describes what this means for the ancient hominins that coexisted with them. The site, called Cromdry, has yielded some significant human fossils before, such as the holotype of the robust Australopithecine Paranthropus robustus, and specimens of early Homo. Looking at the combination of bovid species found here, they indicate that this was a grasslands-dominated environment, with lots of gazelles and antelope, and the site preserves an interesting combination of extinct Pliocene species, as well as species that are still alive today. Based on this fauna, the deposits at Cromdry are estimated to have formed between 2.9 and 1.8 million years ago. Interestingly, if the older date proves to be accurate, then Cromdry would preserve the oldest appearance of Paranthropus robustus in southern Africa. Comparing this site with other hominin-bearing sites in South Africa, the researchers also found that, generally, Australopithecus species are associated with bovids suited to closed, wet environments, while species of Homo are found with bovids adapted to open, dry habitats. Paranthropus, meanwhile, is found with a variety of bovids suited to different environments, suggesting that these robust hominins were able to tolerate a range of conditions. Another fascinating paper then, showing the importance of studying the context in which human fossils are found to learn more about our distant relatives. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, be sure to go follow our TikTok and Instagram accounts if you'd like for more paleontological news updates and short form videos about various extinct animals. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.